So earlier this week, a married couple was shot and killed in downtown San Diego. It's assumed that they were heading to the courthouse for a restraining order hearing. And this one actually hits home because this is the very courthouse that me and my team are in and out of every week defending people and fighting for justice. And so the reason why I wanted to shoot a video on this is because there are a lot of cautionary tales that come from this story, but um, one of the main ones has to do with domestic violence cases. And we get a lot of calls about domestic violence cases. And sometimes people will say, oh, this is a simple case. This is an easy one. This should just get dismissed. And this case right here is exactly why there is no real simple domestic violence case. And in any case, um, a DA, a judge, a police officer has no idea who that guy is going to be who's going to turn around and escalate a mere argument to a fatality. And this guy that killed this couple, you know, ended up actually in a shootout with the police and lost his life that way. And again, no, no cop, no DA, no judge wants to have to second guess themselves after the fact and think, man, well, if I would have arrested that guy or if I would have filed charges against that guy or if I would have kept him in custody, maybe I could have prevented some lives from being lost. And that is exactly the wave that you're up against when you or your loved one um, are facing domestic violence charges. And so, you know, before I get into this, I definitely want to get this out of the way. Um, you got to watch who you get your advice from, right? Because it, it's it, from what I see in the facts of this case, there are a lot of different turns where the people had made better decisions or got better advice then maybe these three would still be alive and, you know, we wouldn't be talking about this tragedy. But um, if you haven't uh, seen any of my videos before, my name is Jamal Kersey. I am the principal attorney at Kersey Law. We're a boutique criminal defense firm in San Diego, and I have represented people in all matters from small time petty theft all the way up to high profile homicide. I'm 15 years into my career and uh, and I love what I do. But uh, talking about this case and, you know, I get paid to give people advice. I get paid to give people my opinion. And so I just want to tell you off the top, listen, if you are married, um, you just shouldn't cheat, right? It's, it's morally wrong. And I know that it's become so accepted in the society to have an affair and to, oh, well, it's just a little fling. Like, nah, it's, it's cheating. It's adultery. It's wrong. Um, and you also shouldn't be messing with uh, with people who are married, right? If you're not married and, and there's somebody that you like and they're in a marriage, like, you know, respect their union and, you know, go find somebody else, right? If, if, if those two pieces of advice have been followed, again, um, all these people might be alive today. So what happened in this story? We have Rachel Martinez and Jose Medina. They were a married couple. And um, apparently, Rachel Martinez had started seeing romantically another guy by the name of Christopher Farrell, right? And so they had been seeing each other for a couple weeks, and Jose ends up finding out. And we've all heard about the story where a guy finds out his wife is cheating or his girlfriend's cheating and then goes and confronts the other man. And it wasn't reported whether that resulted in violence or not, but just that there was a confrontation between them two. So shortly after that, Rachel ends up going to Christopher, her former lover, and apparently tries to break things off, right? And the way that we found out about this is because she ended up going to the police after the fact and reporting the incident. So she goes and tries to break things off. And we've all heard of the guys who, you know, just can't take no for an answer. You know, if it's a, a wife who's trying to leave a husband or a girlfriend trying to leave a boyfriend, or even if you know, two, two people are just talking and, a, and the girl wants to break it off and the guy just can't accept it and they react violently and throwing things around or even, you know, putting hands on the woman. Apparently, this is what happened because she ended up reporting that there was domestic violence, that there were sex crimes committed and false imprisonment. So in other words, she was trying to get away from him and he wouldn't let her go. So just some nasty stuff here. And what makes this even more alarming is uh, Christopher was an armed security guard. So he was working for Metropolitan Transit System. That's our bus system in San Diego. And he was an armed security guard. So after she reported the incident, officers end up going to his job, right? And he ends up getting fired. He ends up getting fired. His, uh, his weapon gets confiscated and he gets taken into custody, right? So naturally, 
if a woman reports domestic violence, false imprisonment, and some sort of sex crime, you know, they're definitely going to be looking for you and take you into custody. Now, when you get arrested, the time between you getting arrested and when you're supposed to be due in court, the police or the arresting agency has to get their reports and evidence over to the prosecutor's office. The prosecutor's office is going to review the file and determine, okay, are there crimes that have been committed? And if so, is it something that I can prove beyond a reasonable doubt? That's what every prosecutor is looking at as they review a file in order to determine if they're going to issue charges. And so any ethical prosecutor, if they look and they say, you know, I think something may have happened, but I don't think I can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, then they're not supposed to issue that case, right? And so in this situation, they needed to do more investigation, right? You can only imagine just how messy the situation was, right? You have Rachel going to the police and reporting this incident. All right, there's this guy I was messing with, but you know, by the way, I'm married. I was messing with this guy. I was breaking it off with him. And then he reacted violently. He committed some sort of, cause they just said generally sex crime. I don't know if it was an actual rape or just a sexual assault or, or what have you, but nonetheless, he flipped out, got violent with her and some nasty things happened, right? So this would be something that the police, a detective, the DA, DA investigators would definitely need to follow up on to just understand better what had happened, right? Because in these type of situations, you also have a lot of false allegations, right? Because sometimes, you know, um, just out of spite, you know, we don't know how that situation ended between Rachel and Christopher. You know, sometimes things get made up and I, I, I absolutely do not want to accuse this woman of having lied or anything. I'm just saying in general, when it comes to these type of offenses, you have love triangles and things, there are just lies all over the place. So they definitely, before deciding to issue charges, against Christopher, they needed to um, get more evidence. So they didn't have sufficient evidence to file charges against him. So presumably he ends up getting released. Now, in a domestic violence case, you're going to have um, what are called victims advocates for the DA's office. And then even the, sometimes a deputy district attorney themselves will reach out to an alleged victim and say, hey, you know, we're not going to be filing charges. Um, we're still investigating this case or there's insufficient evidence or whatever the reason is. And they'll also give them just general information on, you know, where they can go for therapy or counseling, reminding them that they can call the police if, if something happens. And then also the fact that they can go and get a restraining order. And so Rachel goes to get a restraining order. She files a request for a restraining order and she's given a temporary restraining order. Now, what happens in these situations is, you know, you file your request for a restraining order usually there's a declaration section where you put exactly what the aggressor did to you and why you feel like you need a restraining order to protect yourself. And eventually that paperwork has to be served on the other party because a restraining order is a very serious deal. I mean, the information goes to law enforcement, right? And if the person violates the restraining order, then that is a crime. They can be taken into custody and, and criminally charged. And not only that, the person uh, loses their, their rights to bear your firearms, right? So there's a lot of, uh, you know, issues there. And so a person has a right to be heard in court. They have a right to say their side of the story. In some situations, the, the person accused actually ends up filing their own request for a restraining order. So, you know, the judge is going to give you that temporary restraining order, but in order for it to be permanent, there has to be an actual hearing. And so apparently the husband also filed his own request for a restraining order. So both husband and wife filed requests for restraining orders against Christopher. Now you're not supposed to serve the paperwork yourself. So you can either use a, a process server or you can go through the sheriff's department to have deputies serve the, the opposing party. And so that's what they try to do. Sheriff's deputies ended up going to uh, Christopher's job, but remember he ended up getting fired. So he wasn't there. And when I read the story, it was unknown whether Christopher actually ended up getting served at all. So Wednesday was supposed to be the day of the restraining order hearing and the calendar gets called at 9 AM. So it's a morning calendar. And so at 8 22 in the morning, just over half an hour before the 9 AM restraining order calendar was going to start 911 calls start pouring in with people saying that, Hey, they saw, a gunman shooting into a vehicle that was occupied. Christopher, the gunman ended up running off. Police quickly respond and helicopters got involved and everything. Christopher ends up hiding behind one of those big green electric boxes. There are four officers that end up going to pursue him. He ends up pulling out his gun, using that electrical box as a shield. 
starts firing at the officers. He actually hits one of the officers in the hip. Two out of the four officers end up firing back. They hit Christopher and he ends up dying at a hospital about an hour later. The officers ended up finding a semi-automatic handgun and an empty magazine on the ground. And Christopher had three more magazines clipped to his pants. And this is just a situation that unnecessarily ended in violence. This did not have to happen. My thoughts and prayers to that couple, to their families, Christopher and his family, to the officer that was shot, just terrible all around. And be safe out there. You never know what a person is going through. I try and tell people never engage in road rage. You never know who's armed and willing to just do something crazy, throw away their own life just out of spite. Trying to seek revenge violently is never fulfilling. It's either gonna leave you in jail, facing criminal charges, facing prison time, or possibly you know, result in you losing your life. There just are no winners in this heartbreaking story, but if somebody decides not to move forward with, with cheating or somebody decides to go about things the right way, or maybe somebody with anger issues decides to get the help that they need, then you know this video really served its purpose. If you got something out of this, please show me some love, hit the like button, Make sure you're subscribed to the channel and turn on those notifications so you never miss a new video when it drops. And as always, I want to thank you so much for watching. And until next time, peace.